with double bonds and single bonds. And the electron hopping on the double bonds tunnels a little bit faster than the single bonds, you can imagine, because the carbon atoms are a little bit closer. Okay? So if you want to write down a Hamiltonian for this atom, it looks sort of like this. It looks like that of a dimerized lattice. And uh, the tunneling on those bonds is, fat, is different from the tunneling on those bonds. It has two topologically distinct ground states, corresponding to having the double bonds on these sites, or on, on these links here or on the other ones. So here's an experiment that was done in Emmanuel Bloch's group in, uh, in Germany, where they uh, realized this Hamiltonian exactly. So what they did was they superimposed two optical lattices, one with twice the wavelength of the other, twice the periodicity of the other. So what you do is uh, you just take two lasers, one with, say, at 532 nanometers, one at 1064 nanometers, and you create optical lattices with both of them and add up the two potentials. And the resulting potential realizes something like this, where you tunnel fast here and then slow here, fast here, then slow here. Okay, so this is exactly what you have in the SSH model. Um, you can also shift the phase of this long lattice and switch the dimerization in that way. So now what they set out to do in this experiment was to measure the ZAC phase. And the ZAC phase actually for a band is not a quantity that is uh, gauge independent. It depends on the choice of the origin. But what is a gauge independent quantity is the difference in the ZAC phases between the two dimeriz dimerizations. And that is equal to pi. Okay. So if you want to measure a phase, the standard, the first thing that pops to your mind is an interferometer. So here's a a Mach Zender interferometer that you, is, you would use to measure an optical phase. You take a laser beam, send it through a beam splitter, and um, you create a superposition of the photon in the two arms, and then through another beam splitter, and look at the, the interference pattern on a pair of photodiodes. Okay? So you can do the anal analogous thing in an atomic system. So there, you start with the atoms in a single spin state. That's like coming in with the laser beam. You create a superposition so of two quantum states. So let's call them 1 and 2. Right? Those in the, in the experiments are two hyperfine states. There, you can create a superposition by shining a microwave pulse on them. And if it's pi over 2 pulse, it brings the spin into the equatorial plane. And then you have a superposition, which will evolve and can pick up a phase. And this phase difference depends on many things. For example, it can depend on the Zeeman, difference in the Zeeman energies between the two states, or it could depend on something like the Zach phase, if they're moving in a periodic potential. Yeah? Uh, because they're a Bose-Einstein. These experiments are with a Bose-Einstein condensate. So they will sit in the minimum of the dispersion. Okay. Okay, so after this evolution of the phase, then you apply a second pi over 2 pulse, that's just like the second beam splitter. And that takes you back to your measurement basis of up and down. And you go and measure with a stern garlock experiment how many spins you have, the population up and the population in down. All right? So for this SSH model, the band structure actually looks exactly like what I've drawn here. It's two bands, because you have these A and B sites, you have two bands. And... Uh, the difference in the Zach phase between the two is pi, as I said. So let's see how you can do an interferometry sequence to measure that. So what uh, this group did was they start with the Bose-Einstein condensate, like, you, like we said, it sits at the minimum of the dispersion here of the bottom band, and they start with a single spin state. They prepare a superposition by applying a microwave pulse. So I'll denote that superposition by having some green atoms and some yellow atoms. Then we'd like to measure the Zach phase. So what do you do? You have to move the particle adiabatically through this uh, band. So what they do there is uh, they apply a field gradient. And this gradient acts the opposite way. The, force, the resulting force is the opposite way for the two spin states, because those two spins have opposite magnetic moments. So the green atoms move to the right, and the yellow atoms move to the left. So now we've scanned this bottom band and we've picked up any Zach phase that you would have there. But we've also, unfortunately, picked up an additional 
well, could we have picked up a kinematic phase? Uh, well, there's no, th there's an inversion symmetry in this lattice, so uh, you won't pick up any phase due to the dispersion, but you would pick up a, a Zeeman phase because those are into, there's a large magnetic field that splits the green from the yellow state. Okay, so you'll pick up that Zeeman phase and you'd like to cancel that out to isolate the, the Zach phase. So what they do in this experiment is they simply now apply an, a spin echo pulse. So they, they apply a pi pulse, take the yellow to green. So here yellow goes to green and green goes to yellow. But at the same time, they flip the dimerization of the lattice. Okay? Because if they don't flip the dimerization of the lattice and now they continue applying the magnetic field, what would happen? Those balls would roll back to the minimum again. And so you cancel out the Zach phase. But by flipping the dimerization of the lattice, the atoms end up in the excited state. And so now when you continue applying the magnetic field, they would scan back to this maximum and therefore now scan the blue curve. And what you end up with is measuring the difference of the Zach phases for those two bands. So if you apply a pi over two poles, like this is the end beam splitter, you can now measure the spin populations and extract the, the Zach phase. So that's what they see. It's a difference of pi between flipping the dimerization and not flipping the dimerization. All right, so is this just a very specific technique to this? No, it turns out they can do it in much more complicated um, setups. For example, here's graphene, where again we know the answer. Graphene has a Berry phase of pi around each Dirac point, but let's see how they do it there. So here's graphene. It has a hexagonal lattice with A and B sites. Those are the red and the blue sites. And the Hamiltonian is just a tight binding Hamiltonian with tunneling between nearest neighbors. Because you have those two sets of sites, you have two bands, which you can encode in a spinner. And that couples in momentum space to magnetic field. If you write this Hamiltonian momentum space, it couples to magnetic field that's momentum dependent. Okay. So here's, unfortunately, it doesn't show up on the slides, but I have white arrows that, um, that basically show you the, the magnetic field at every point in momentum, what it looks like. So the magnetic field turns out to be in the equatorial plane, right? Um, so we can, it's a function only of kx and ky because of the time reversal inversion symmetry in, uh, in graphene. And therefore, if you look at what it does around each Dirac point, it turns out this Dirac point has a winding of at least a Berry phase of pi, while the other ones would have a Berry phase of minus pi. And all the Berry phase is really concentrated at the Dirac point. So here in this picture, we've, uh, we, we introduce a little bit of a gap. We break the inversion symmetry to introduce a little bit of a gap to spill the Berry curvature outside just so that you can see it, okay? But in the real experiment, there's almost no inversion. There's the, the inversion symmetry is almost perfect, so there's almost no gap. So this invites basically a realization of this arnov bohm experiment. You have a flux line, and you expect a Berry phase of pi going around it. So they've, they've done exactly, I, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but basically they've done a similar interferometry sequence. They drag the, they prepare a superposition. They drag the different parts of the superposition in different directions using magnetic field and go around the Dirac point and then measure the spin populations and they see this pi phase. So here they've demonstrated it in a couple of models where we know the answer. Okay. okay, so to summarize, what I've shown you so far today in this first talk is I've introduced these cold atom systems and how they can be used for cold atom simulations, uh, for quantum simulations. I've shown you the earlier approaches people use simply by rotating the gas. And then I've told you about this idea of laser dressing, which can introduce a vector potential. Okay. And by introducing a spatial dependence, you can produce a magnetic field. And now people are moving towards using optical lattices to engineer topological band structures. So you've seen models which have a topological band structure, like this SSH model or graphene and how you can measure the band structure there. Uh, you can measure the Berry phase associated with these band structures with atom interferometry. So next time, as I said, I'll go to optical lattices which do not have any topological band structure associated, but will add some topology in using, uh, for example, Raman transitions, and see, measure, see how you can measure churn numbers uh, in these systems. 
And then I'll switch completely to different topics, spin orbit coupling, and show you how the same Raman transition techniques that I've uh, already illustrated can also now be used to engineer spin orbit coupling. So that's on Friday. Okay, thank you very much. my experiment, this is the oh, yeah, block groups yeah. experiment, and they switch the dimerization with this, I mean like, you, you, uh, it's a non-adiabatic change, which maps the atoms to the excited state, and they do it simply by changing the phase of an electro-optical modulator. Uh, it's, it's like an instantaneous change, essentially. Uh, I don't understand which one. Like it just flips the the atoms, put the, puts the atoms in the excited band, basically. Yeah. So, uh, I guess cold atoms sometimes sound a little bit like magic, but I've heard there are actually quite significant like technical challenges. Sorry, I'm up here, so I'm So I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about, about like, the physical cha technical challenges and like, actually doing this? Okay, well can talk about technical challenges, but uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the challenges like facing this program of quantum simulation also. And the, the main challenge here is that compared to real like electronic systems, we are not very degenerate. So for example, a typical temperature for, the, for a Fermi gas is the ratio of the temperature to the Fermi temperature that people achieve is about 0 0.05, which uh, if you convert to something in a solid, this would be a very high temperature. Okay, so uh, reaching like these many body phases is extremely challenging. So what you've seen so far and what you'll also see in, on Friday is mostly single particle physics experiments. But the promise here with these cold atoms is that we do have interactions. And so for example, if you're engineering things like topological insulators, you can easily add interactions to them. Uh, the question of whether the phases, we are at low enough temperatures to observe these phases is an open question. And in some cases, um, we can actually boost the interactions using techniques which I haven't talked about, like Feshbach resonances, and actually reach phases that are uh, basically boost the critical temperatures to very high temperatures that we can then uh, tackle. But that's not always the case. So that's, that would be the main challenge, for example, for reaching a fractional quantum hole uh, system with bosons. Um, experimentally, I mean, there's lots of challenges, <laughs> vacuum chambers, laser systems. Um, Yeah. In, in, uh, in cold atom systems, you can simulate uh, pumping by putting in lasers from outside, right? My, my question is, can you simulate uh, sort of like the damping using cold atom systems? Um, I mean, the systems are, well, what we taught them for is their complete isolation from the environment. Um, so typically, like, Damping in the sense of like, you mean like uh, adding phonons or stuff like that? Yes. Yeah, so that's, uh, th those systems are extremely coherent, but you can start to introduce, for example, phonons on a, in a, by combining, for example, different species. So you could put some fermions in a lattice and then add a BEC to that. And the BEC would mediate, uh, would have its phonons as, as its low energy excitations, and it could mediate, say, look like something like a, Phonons in a in a lattice, um, but it's all very coherent phenomena. Uh, in that experiment, rotating BEC, do uh, all those vortex lines to be have the same vorticity, or can we also have opposite vorticity? Th those are in those experiments are the same vorticity, uh, and. Maybe uh, let's play this question to next time. Next time I'll tell you about realization of the Hofstadter model. In those experiments you have a lattice where you create a flux per plaquette. And in those experiments they've done both fluxes that are like on a checkerboard with opposite vorticities. 
or they can also do them such that it's uni a uniform field throughout. But in that experiment, it's, they're all pointing the same way. So uh, is there some, something about like a, a, a many-body state that you can access with a cold item experiment that would be impractical even like uh, numerically with a computer? Yeah. So can you give some examples? Of uh, sure. The, the best example to give is the unitary Fermi gas. So that is, a, it's a very simple system. You can uh, just take a, a gas of fermions, like the lithium gas I have in the lab. It's actually this. So you can talk to, for example, some of my graduate students here. They do this every day. They tune it um, to what's known as a Feshbach resonance, where you tune the scattering length to a very large value. And that's, it turns out there's a, what's called a unitary limit. And in that limit, um, it's, it's basically like just a kinetic energy plus an S-wave interaction, which is very large. And in that limit, um, the, for example, the critical temperature of the, superflu of the fermionic superfluid that you would get for attractive interactions is very high on the order of 0.16 of the Fermi energy. So it's, if you map the temperatures there to a solid, it's a, it's a high temperature super, uh, superfluid. But uh, predicting anything about its properties is like an extremely hard problem theoretically. So with bosons, I think the situation with Monte Carlo simulations is a lot, uh, it's a lot easier. With fermions, there's this fermion sign problem, which makes things a lot uh, harder for predicting theoretical properties. The other example I can give you, which, so there with the, with the fermionic superfluid, people have like, are in the interesting ground state, sort of. The other uh, interesting model is, would be just the Fermi-Hubbard model, for example, that a lot of labs have realized. But reaching the ground state there has been extremely challenging. But then also like predicting properties of the, of the uh, Fermi-Hubbard model at the regime where cold atoms are at finite temperature is also an interesting, I think, and an extremely challenging problem theoretically. So there, have been a lot of, there has been a lot of back and forth between theory and experiment where people have pushed to developing new Monte Carlo tools, for example, to predict what's happening in cold atom systems that can be used for condensed matter systems. Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker.